Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast. I'm Colin Hunter, your host. Today, joined by Rich Deveni. Uh, Rich's background, amazing. He's an author of The Attributes, but his work is based on his work as in the SEALs team where he was in charge of the training for a specific area, but yeah, he'll talk about that today. Um, also some work with Simon Sinek, so where Simon has talked in the past about the SEALs experiences and some of the links to how you recruit and how teams are formed within the SEALs. This is from his conversations with Rich. So fascinating insight into the, the work of the SEALs, into leadership, some great stories, uh, particularly like in, uh, the work on the attribute side, because it's something in assessment and leadership that we've been looking at for, for a while, but it plays into this piece of what are these attributes and how do you drill into the attributes to show that beyond the skill and behavior, which you can teach, what are the core attributes that will tell you and have a view into what is the potential of the person for the future. So I'm sure you'll love this. I'm sure you will love the conversation with Rich and I'll look forward to hearing your feedback. Welcome, Rich. Thank you for joining us uh, on the podcast. Um, for the listeners, tell us your story so far, your background. Well, I grew up in, in the States, in Connecticut, and joined the Navy in 1996. Um, back then, decided to go to a, a, a fairly little-known unit called the Navy SEALs. No one really knew what Navy SEALs were back in the mid-90s. Um, joined up and went through that training and uh, and spent 20 years, 21 years almost, in the in the SEAL team. So obviously, uh, lived a very kinetic career in the SEAL teams. The SEAL teams obviously grew to some enorm, enormous fame uh, throughout that time, which was really very bizarre for us uh, while we were in it. Um, but, uh, but really learned, I, I was an officer in the team, so I learned quite a bit about leadership. I learned quite a bit about assessing and selecting and hiring and, and picking and, and kind of building the very top highest performing teams on the planet and how that works. And of course, I, I went to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, did many, about 13 combat tours uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. So learned what that felt like in in real world and in combat and war. Um, I retired in 2017. And when I retired, I went into the leadership space with a couple of friends of mine, one of whom is Simon Sinek, who wrote a great book called Start With Why. I uh, started the leadership space and, and got really intrigued with the idea of performance and leadership. I was always in, in, in really interested in performance. Uh, and I knew leadership comes from performance. Performance starts out, every it, it starts everything. It's kind of the baseline. And so so what I did was I kind of started thinking about how I was able to restructure a specific training and assessment program when I was still in the Navy SEAL teams in terms of what are those unique qualities that we look for when we're building the highest performing teams and and what is it that really defines performance other than just visible skills. And so I wrote a book on that called The Attributes and that released in January 2021. And uh, for the last two years, I've been really building a, a business of consulting um, with organizations and, and and companies and teams to help them figure out the attributes required for their teams and figure out how to build the best highest performing teams on the planet so so here we are that's uh that's uh, that's it in what three minutes <laughs> three minutes wow okay that's it we're done, yeah, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd love to dig into a few things of those because uh, you know my background i've got a few connections who are ex sbs mm -hmm. So there's something about the, you know, we didn't know the fame of the SEALs was going to happen, but there's something unique about uh, the boat, Special Boat Service and the SEALs in terms of what it offers and why it's, it has such resonance to us. Yeah. And I, I'd love to dig into a few of the things that you think are so poignant about it. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that if I were to pick one thing that was the most unique about both ser uh, both services, uh, both units, because we're very similar. I've I've we, I worked with a bunch of SPS guys when I was uh, in the teams, uh, and that is water. Mm. <laughs> water is a uh, a tremendous um, assessment tool. Uh, it uh, and it's an equalizer on every level, and uh, and the idea that that units like the SEALs and the SPS uh, make water there. They're kind of their home, their their home base, uh, which is a very, I mean, well, you know, the ocean is a very hostile uh, hostile environment. I mean, it's cold. It's 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 there's pressure at depths. It'll it'll kill you, you know, within seconds if you if you turn your back on it. And um and the fact that these units make that our safe place, um, I thought was really kind of audacious and uh, and cool. I always I always loved the water myself growing up. I grew up on the coast, so I loved it. But that that's uh, that's a, a tremendous equalizer because some of the toughest people on the planet 
um, and the people you would perceive to be the toughest people or the most skilled or most talented, you put them in an environment that involves the ocean um, and uh, and it changes the game. And that, I think that's that that's a very unique quality of those two units that uh, that the army units don't necessarily have. Um, because other than those other than those things were fairly similar. The spec ops units are fairly similar, but that water environment is is really quite quite unique. Mm, I love that, and I also just loved uh, a couple of the things that I I remember from the Marines, the SBS, and the SEALs piece. And I always remember Simon. Didn't realize that uh, you had that connection, but talking about how you pick characters because it's not about you know it's not about the arrogance it's not about how you know many press ups how many push ups you can do it's it is the concept of the team and that's one of the things around the marines as well was the concept of the team it's always about the team yeah it always and it's funny, it's funny Simon and I have been friends now for years all, all the stuff Simon talks about when it comes to seals is stuff that we talked about because and and he didn't he didn't want to give me credit because I was still in the teams when he was talking about it so but uh but he's he's and he's such a great way it, he articulates so, so well but ultimately uh you cannot survive let alone succeed in in the in this such uh kind of uh, uh uncertain challenging environments if you don't have a proper team um and and the team that's built on the proper the proper ingredients um and that's really what i dive into the proper ingredients has very little to do with the the visible skills that we all come to the, you know, that we all might learn along the way, uh, but has much more to do with these attributes, these qualities that kind of define our performance um, and, and are more innate. Talk to me about the attributes because I'm fascinated by that. Uh, and again, linking it back to this, it's, it's, this is what I would call purposeful practice. You practice, you're a practice leader in what these are. So talk to us about what these are. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is, uh, is that we often uh, look at performance, um, just at the surface level. And we look at what I would define as skills, very visible things. So skills, just to kind of put it into, into real simple terms, skills are, uh, they're not inherent to our nature. In other words, we, none of us are born with the ability to ride a bike or throw a ball or, or drive a car, right? We're taught to do those things. We learn how to do those things. Skills direct our behavior in known and specific environments. So here's how and when to throw a ball or ride a bike or drive a car. And then skills, because they're very visible, they're very easy to assess and measure. In other words, you can see how well anybody does any one of those things. And you can put scores around them and, and stats around them. Um, but this is why we get seduced by skills when we're picking teams a lot of times, because you can put skills on a resume and you can you can, uh, you can can see the stats, you can see the numbers on a skills. The problem with skills is they don't tell us how we're going to show up in stress, challenge, and uncertainty. Because in an unknown environment, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to apply a known skill. This is when we lean on our attributes. Attributes, on the other hand, are innate. All right, all of us are born with levels of patience, adaptability, resilience, uh, situation awareness. Now, we can certainly develop these things over time and experience, but you can see levels of this stuff in very small children, which means there's a nature nurture element to attributes. Attributes don't direct our behavior; they inform our behavior. They tell us how we're going to show up to an environment. So, in other words, my son's levels of resilience and perseverance informed the way he showed up when he was learning the skill of riding a bike, and he was falling off a dozen times doing so. Right, uh, and then finally, because they're hidden in the background, they're very difficult to assess and measure and test. It's hard to see them, hard to measure them. You, you can see them the most visibly and viscerally during times of stress, challenge, and uncertainty. Uh, but they often get overlooked in, in in normal interview processes or or hiring processes because there's not a lot of stress and challenge involved, and and people are just kind of seduced by these and drawn to the the big the big red light that that is skills. But the, if we're if we're discounting attributes and performance, we're discounting a huge huge portion of the performance picture, and most definitely we're discounting the 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 portion of performance that matters most when you want a team to operate in uncertain, challenging, and stressful situations. It resonates with me because part of our assessment for our uh, team is we do a 10-minute exercise where it's a role play, but it's a real scenario where they're put under pressure by a client and they have to respond. And what we're testing is not that they get a successful outcome, but it's about how they stay resilient and stay yes. connected in the moment. And, and that's what the SEALs would have done to test yeah, um, what they were doing. So, well, so how, in interesting military yeah. training holistically um, across the board. Obviously, the SEALs take it to the extreme level, as do the SBS, right? But uh, yeah. holistically, it's about throwing people into very challenging environments. In other words, I I spent you know SEAL training, for example, it's called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition Slash SEAL Training. It's out in, in San Diego, California. It's six months long. 
It's one of the most, it's known as one of the most arduous programs on the planet. You, it's about a, a 90% attrition rate. So only about 10% of the folks who start finish it, right? You spend in SEAL training. I remember when I was doing this work, I, I, I recalled, uh, uh, so you spend hundreds of hours in SEAL training, running around with big heavy boats on your head, exercising with 300 pound telephone poles and running around with those things, doing thousands of push-ups, freezing in their surf zone. And as I thought about it, when I was doing this work initially, I, I had already been, I already done hundreds of combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. I had done thousands of training evolutions. Never on one of them did I ever carry a heavy boat on my head or a, tel a 300 pound telephone pole, right? So, so what they were doing in those training, in that training was not training us in the skills to be Navy SEALs. They were putting us into situations, into environments into experiences to tease out these attributes because that's what they were looking for. And that's why these, uh, that's why the military holistically, ha this is kind of an unconscious genius about military boot camp or, or the, the training like that. They're, they're, they're looking for attributes first and then they start training. Okay. Now we're going to show you how to, how to manage and shoot your gun, right? That's a skill, <laughs> but they have to have the attributes first. So talk to me about potential. Cause that's always a, you know, when we do assessments and when we're working with clients, there's that piece where, okay, in that moment, you have demonstrated X of attributes. Yeah. Now, it could have been luck, could have been judgment, but there's a, a pretty strong case for saying you did this in this moment, therefore you would do it in other moments and replicate it. Yeah. But the potential is always the issue because no matter, we always talk about 60% roughly, you put somebody through an assessment process and then 60%, but it, there's nothing like putting them into, as you say, without the telegraph pole into the line of fire or whatever else is going on. So developing the potential of those attributes is another piece in there. It's a wonderful question. And one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things about attributes is attributes does show pot potential. I always say skills tell us what is, attributes tell us what could be. Um, because attributes show us, okay, what does this person have inside of them such that I can put them in any environment and that will show up. And so, so the best people, the best team builders are people who build teams based on these attributes. I, 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 you know, I don't use athletics as an, ex as an example quite often because athletics, just the environment of athletics is fairly certain, right? Um, but I will say, and, and, and the, the, your audience over there might know the New England Patriots as one of the most successful football teams or American football teams um, in history, I got to sit down with Bill Belichick several years ago, some of their height, height of their success. And, and we had a conversation. I remember talking to him about, about some of this stuff. And, and it was interesting because what I recognized about him is when he talked about his selection process of players, it was largely attribute focused. <laughs> it really wasn't necessarily, he wasn't necessarily looking for the the, the, the best skilled guy. And, and, and actually Tom Brady, again, one of the, one of the greatest, you know, uh, American football players in history is a great example of this. Tom Brady, I think he was ninth in the draft, right? I mean, he didn't, he, he didn't present as the highest, the most skilled player at the time when he was drafted to the, to the Patriots. Right. But he, there was after that he has attributes there. There's, there's potential there. And so, so if we start focusing on these attributes, we start to see potential. Just one other example to put this in the business sense, right? If you, you know, I always talk in the book, I talk about uh, empathy, for example, and decisiveness being, those are both leadership attributes. They're attributes that, that are assigned to, to great leaders. Usually you, great leaders have a preponderance of those. Well, you could have a, a person who starts out at level one in the mail room, right? And if you're if you're if you're if you're putting that person in experiences where you're seeing decisiveness and you're seeing empathy, right? Suddenly you're getting a picture onto the potential of this person. You're saying to yourself, "Oh, wait a second, this person is showing some potential. This person could be could end up being a leader at this organization because I'm seeing these attributes." And that's why attributes are so important uh, when it when it comes to looking at potential. I love that embedding into a real uh, business example because yeah, we we get criticized. We use sporting analogies, other pieces in there, whether it's rowing or whatever it is. Yeah, and when we get it back to the business context, uh, it, it is important. And we had an example where we were recruiting a, or running an assessment center for a big chemical plant, and the person who got the job was actually somebody who was a scientist in the laboratory to to get that and now in his first week they had a death on the plant from cyanide which was a side effect a side product that was delivered in there but it was how he dealt with it were all the attributes as you're talking about that we saw in the assessment center so if you were coaching somebody in a business at the moment about how to to do that and what to do 
that's your current work, isn't it? I mean, I know you're working on, you know, the, the uncertainty piece that the SEALs taught and how you do that. How do you teach people that? Well, so, so it's, it's less about teaching and more about uh, illuminating. And so what we do with clients is we go into organizations and we help them understand and figure out their unique list of attributes, first off, because, because every organization, every team is going to have a different list of attributes that is required for that team. In other words, the, the attribute list that, that a, a Navy SEAL, great Navy SEAL team requires is going to look different than the attribute list of a great teaching team or a surgical team or a business team, right? So, so the first thing we do is we help organizations figure out what that master list looks like. And then we say, okay, based on the roles in your organization, what does each specific role require in terms of attributes? You use the master list as a guide. Now you have a template from which you can start assessing attributes. And then you say, okay, if we're looking for things like, you know, social intelligence, empathy, humility, what are some assessment selection tools that we can use? Usually let's take what you are doing currently and just tweak it so that we're now looking at attributes. Attributes always sit on the periphery of what you're looking at. So I'll give you a business example because I, I think it's a fairly easy one to understand. Imagine you and I call and wanted to, to hire someone who's great at sales, okay? And so we tell this person on Friday, hey, come in Monday morning and you're going to sell us this pencil, okay? Um, that person spends the weekend preparing. We come in Monday morning. The person sits, sits or, or we get in front of the, or the person gets in front of us and proceeds to wow us on a, a pencil presentation. We're just like, blows our mind. We're like, oh my gosh, this person just awesome, right? The problem is you and I would not have learned very much. What we, what we have learned is that the person is really good at preparing and presenting a sales presentation. So instead, what we do is we tell the person on Friday, hey, come in Monday, you're going to sell us this pencil. We come in Monday morning. And when the person gets there, we say, hey, the plan's changed. You're no longer selling us this pencil. You're going to sell us this coffee mug. Okay. And by the way, there's no audio visual. So, uh, so just do what you need to do. Now, at that point, what you and I have to do is make a very deliberate decision to divorce ourselves from skills assessment, because what we're about to see is going to be ugly. Okay, but no, we're not looking at skills anymore. We're looking at attributes. How does this person deal with it? Right? Or do they do they make jokes? Do they do they do they make it work? Do they do they kind of get on a roll, whatever, whatever it is, or do they spiral downward? Do they make excuses? Do they kick the dirt? Now we're looking at attributes and we say, okay, so what are the attributes we're looking for? So, so we can take assessment selection and hiring processes and we can tweak them in a way that injects a little bit of uncertainty and challenge. And we start seeing these attributes show up in the periphery, but the only, the requirement, the prerequisite is you have to know what attributes you're looking for, because if you don't know what attributes you're looking for, it's a waste of time. It's just a, it's more of a Machiavellian <laughs> um, exercise. It's a nice thing to observe and have <laughs> you know that's really right. you yeah. did that that's right. so, so that's so we do that work it's very subjective to each organization um and i think my sense is as we do it more and more often and maybe we, we kind of get uh, get a, a ton of data we may find some a little bit more ubiquitous types of things in terms of hey this attribute you can do this but but again every every i mean again what humility in on a surgical team is going to look different than a humility on a seal team and empathy on a SEAL team is going to look different than empathy in a nursing home, right? So, uh, so, so you have to think about the subjectivity of that stuff. So it's almost defining. So under each of these attributes is what you're saying. So, because what I'm hearing under all of these assessments is some sort of resilience. You know, I always remember a story when we were doing an assessment center where the exercise was somebody had lost what we call a box that was to be delivered to a client, and they had to adapt. Um, and it was that classic moment that the assessment had finished and there was a knock at the door as we were doing the wash up, um, knock at the door. And this, one of the candidates was at the door with her visually held, holding her hands out in front with nothing in it and going, I found the box. Yeah. And you got that moment of going, okay, how do I deal with this? So we said, thank you very much. Very good. Yep. Yeah. Can you go back to the room? What you're testing there is resilience, one. Second is creativity in the moment to think around the, the issue. But I love the way that you're talking about the under resilience. There could be many different versions of resilience depending on the context that you're, you're yeah, in. Yeah, I would almost yeah. say res resilience is actually one attribute that I talk about, and it actually falls under the grit category. And in, in the book, I talk about five categories. One of the categories is grit. So what are the attributes that make up grit? Because grit is not one singular thing. It's a bunch of things kind of blended and catalyzed. So so resilience is simply one. The attributes, just to, to give the audience a quick, uh, a quick yeah. uh, summary, are the attributes that make up grit are courage, adaptability, perseverance, and resilience. Okay, to have a preponderance of most of those means you will likely be a gritty person. But we know that resilience, and the way we define, the way I define resilience as an attribute, is the ability to bounce back 
from from uh, from setback or even success. In other words, we think about a rubber band. A rubber band is resilient. When you stretch it, it goes back to its baseline. So so it's the ability to go, go get, get hit and come back to baseline, or have a success come back to baseline. The, the 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 faster and more efficiently one can do that speaks to their level of resilience. We all know, and we could probably name people in our in our uh, in our lives who are very gritty, successful people, but they're burnt out. And the reason is because they haven't practiced resilience. They don't have enough resilience. They keep going. A lot of top performers suffer from this, and a lot of Navy SEALs suffer from this from a long term. Obviously, we're resilient in terms we can bounce back and we can keep going. We can keep doing, but are we really bouncing back? Most, a lot of high top performers, they do the thing, they accomplish the goal, and they're like, okay, what's next? Instead of saying, oh, wait, I, I need to take time to recover, right? That's true resilience. And so resilience is, uh, resilience is was one of the most important things, and it is a singular attribute. Interesting. And it, and it goes back to the, you know, I was chatting to Michelle Curran, who is uh, Mace, who's this uh, fighter pilot, and she was talking about how they would train for an hour and then review. Mm -hmm. um, so... Talk to me about the attribute around that, because one is resilience. And as you say, I've succeed, succeeded, I'm on to the next thing. But learning must be a key thing in those attributes as well. So the after action review, which is a, a military mainstay, right? And in other words, and no matter what we do afterwards, whether it's successful or failure or whatever, we always do a, a review. We say what, what, what went wrong, what went right, what could be do better. Uh, that, is a, that is actually a skill and it's a habit. And what that does is that helps learn, it helps solidify, it helps the team grow. Um, the attributes associated with that, which are much more elemental, attributes, again, are very elemental. We want to, I'm really interested in going to the very elemental things of behavior. And the way I do that is I say to myself, okay, who are we at our most raw? <laughs> How do we show up at our most raw? And then when we when we see ourselves at our most raw, we're at the elemental thing. So, so the attributes are really ele elemental. But Learnability is an attribute I talk about, um, and that's one of the mental acuity attributes. And learnability is an attribute that describes someone's ability to absorb and uh, and metabolize the lessons around them. You know, now we all have again, we all have all of these attributes. It just depends on the levels to which. So, people who are higher on learnability are really high on learnability. Other people, you can tell them how to do something once, then they got it. You only have to tell them once. Okay. People who are lower are the people who make the make the mistake a couple of times. I'm a little bit lower. Admittedly, I'm, I've always been a little bit lower on learnability. I, I make the same mistakes a couple of times. I have to really kind of think through. When I was in my own SEAL training, um, I had to really spend extra time learning because I knew it was going to take me longer. And then well, there were some guys who they just went through the day of training and they went out drinking because they were done, right? <laughs> they, yeah. they got it, right? <laughs> it takes me longer. So again, there's no judgment on this. It's just where we show up. So so this after action review is a is a habit. It's a skill you can build as a team and a habit you can build as a team that exemplifies the ability to kind of learn the lessons, be resilient as a group. Uh, but it's these attributes uh, that, you know, that we carry as individuals that will speak to the, the, uh, the, the efficiency with which we do some of this stuff. So love it. So let's go into the mastering of uncertainty. We're talking about it a bit now. We talked about attributes and we're going into the, the work that you're currently doing. What's the linkage for me? And then what's the depth that you're going into on that? Yeah. yeah. So when I was still in the Navy SEAL teams and I was running, so I got to run SEAL training, but it wasn't regular SEAL training. It was one of the, it was an assessment selection for one of our very, very specialized SEAL commands. And I ran the assessment selection for that. So, so in that time frame, I was able to really kind of uh, research a lot of this stuff and, and, and kind of figure a lot of this out. And, and one of the things that I used to and continue to describe the Navy SEALs as especially as the Navy SEALs gained popularity, is it was never about the, sh the shooting or the skydiving or the scuba diving or the, or the sexy stuff you see on the movies. We are masters of uncertainty. We are p individuals and teams that can drop into deeply complex and ambiguous environments and just figure it out and, and perform. That's what we do. Um, and so I became fascinated with what it takes to be that. Uh, what does it take to be a master of uncertainty as an individual and as a team? Uh, the linkage is that uh, one of the steps that it takes is to understand your attributes. And so what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm putting together, I'm writing the next book. The next book will, will be, Hey, these are the steps it takes. Okay. But, but one of the steps is attributes and just to give you a preview. Um, one of the steps is, is understanding where your faith comes from. And, and when I, when I say faith, it doesn't necessarily mean religious faith. Faith can come from a, a couple different areas, but there has to be some faith, right? The number two is understanding your identity. In other words, what, how do I identify myself in the world? Um, Number three is understanding our attributes. The attributes, the attributes speak to how our engine performs. In other words, I need to understand 
you know, if I'm a Jeep or I'm a Ferrari, you know, because I, because if I'm, a, if I'm a Jeep running on a Ferrari track, I need to know that I need to know where the friction points are going to be there. So, so that's, so those are three pieces. And then it moves into, okay, now we have to understand our physiology. We have to understand how to reframe stress, fear, and uncertainty because, because they are for purpose. Um, stress and stress and anxiety are designed by nature to get us moving, to help us pay attention, to kind of, to get us to do something, right? So there, and fear is designed as a, uh, as a risk assessment tool. It's our human risk assessment tool. So it's a good thing, right? Um, so these things are designed by nature to help us. And so the idea is to reframe them and leverage them. And we get specific biochemical responses in our systems when this stuff shows up that we can utilize and we can really uh, 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 exemplify to help us through. So understanding that and then starting to understand how, what are some tools we can use to manage our own physiology? A lot of what happens in uncertainty, challenge, and stress because our, our autonomic system goes, uh, our autonomic arousal goes way up. Uh, we, our frontal lobe, our conscious mind just go, starts to go offline. Most human beings in deep stress start to act without thinking or they, or, you know, they either freeze or, or do something. Um, how do we manage our autonomic response to get our frontal lobe back in? And we start making conscious decisions through that uncertainty challenge. This is what the Navy SEALs are our, our masters at really that's that's what masters is and then how do you do it as a team and, and it's all about understanding that as an individual and then how do you as a team begin to build trust that's the key factor by the way build trust in the team so you can begin to do it together and operate as a uh as a dynamic unit that looks a lot more like a like a school of fish or a flock of birds than it does a um any type of any type of garrison or or machine so so those are the kind of the steps i'm putting together i'm, I'm, I'm excited about kind of kind of wiring those all up and um and attributes is just one piece so it's good to kind of start with that because it's kind of a big one so i'm loving the work on the faith side because as you say it's not about spiritual religious it's it but it's about it's almost a step within the alcoholics anonymous process which is uh, you know uh, realizing there is something that uh is out there that has got this and you haven't so how do you how do you deal with it it's really well, um i i kind of define it and i say this in a very um neutral way because i don't want to you know i don't want anybody to take this wrong way but but faith really is belief without evidence and so so where do we get our belief without evidence some people get it from uh from religious faith some people get it from the universe some people get it from themselves you know whatever, whatever that is but but that is a key element uh whenever we're stepping into uncertainty and challenge and I do love the link also, because this is one of the things that I've been mulling on, which is the link between it, it's fine to be an individual and uh, and find resilience and attributes. It's then how do you mix together the right mix, as you said earlier on, into the, the team. And some people say, well, there must be a, some sort of recipe that works. And actually, th there's no real <laughs> recipe for what it's yeah. about trial and error. But then how do you evolve as a team? So I presume that's where the, this is going into when you start to look at the team. It absolutely is. And one thing is, so I said trust is the, is the, is the key factor. But, uh, but if I were to say if the one key ingredient for the recipe to do it as a team, and people are going to be surprised by this, but it's vulnerability. Uh, it's the ability for team members and people, people, you know, say, well, Navy SEALs, Navy SEALs are some of the most vulnerable guys on the planet. And people are like, what? And because vulnerability, the way we define it is different than most people define it. There's a stigma around vulnerability that, that speaks to someone's weaknesses, right? It's actually about showing your strengths and your weaknesses, laying it out all into wearing it all on your sleeve. I need my teammates to understand exactly what I'm really strong at and exactly what I'm really weak at, because then they know when they can support me and when I can support them. And if we're, if we have that vulnerability, that's the key, obviously it's a key factor in trust, but we begin to understand each other as a unique machine and the machine starts to talk to each other, you know, talk, talk to its pieces and parts. So the carburetor is not doing the job of the, of the muffler and the muffler is not doing the job of the, of the axle, uh, you know, or the steering or whatever that is. We all, the team understands when to step up and when to step back. I like it because obviously Simon was on with Brené Brown. It plays into the vulnerability work she's been doing, yeah. but also I, the bit about getting into the arena. So the man yeah. in the arena, yeah. I'm working in there. So that works. So I want to come to a few questions for you. And I think I'd love to get your answers to this. So the, the first bit is is focused on what are the small memorable bits that have shaped you as a leader and are deliberately focusing on the small piece, not the big things that have shaped you as a leader. And that's the first question for you. Yeah. Um, one small story I'll tell you, it, it speaks to the kind of the, the weight of leadership. We were getting ready to go on a deployment. I was a commanding officer of a SEAL squadron. I was getting ready to take the whole squadron on deployment. And uh, we did a, uh, we did a weekend at a kind of a resort area. The community was 
was great back then, kind of get all the families together, spend a weekend doing some fun stuff. And so I get to meet all the families and all that stuff. I remember finishing up that weekend and I was uh, I was saying goodbye to some guys and, and their wives. And I remember as I was saying goodbye to one guy and his wife, his wife, you know, came up and gave me a hug. And as she hugged me, she whispered in my ear, please, please bring my husband back alive. And I remember hearing that, of course, I, you know, I, you know, audibly, I said, of course, you know, of course I will. And it's on our way. Um, non-audibly and psychologically, that that comment brought me to my knees uh, because I recognized the weight of leadership. Uh, and so I think we have to understand that that uh, that that we have that responsibility as leaders, even if it's in a business, we have the responsibility of people. And so that was a kind of a, a small thing that that I remember that was very, very visceral for me. Sure. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that brought a tear to my eye when you you did that because, you know, and this is sometimes the translation piece for, for people who say, so what are you doing in your world that's comparable to that? But, you know, I'm a big believer as a business owner. I have accountability for the community that I have, and that can be somebody's life, somebody's job, but you're talking about somebody's life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. So, if you had, and this is going to be fascinating because I, I want to try link it into the attributes piece for you and the work that you're doing. If you had one thing that you could disrupt about uh, leaders nowadays, leadership nowadays, what would it be? Just one thing. It's this, uh, that being in charge and being a leader are two separate things. And um, we don't get to call ourselves leaders. We don't get to self-designate. That's like, that's like uh, calling yourself good looking or funny. Other people decide whether or not you're good looking or funny. Other people decide whether or not you are a leader because other people decide whether or not they want to follow you. And, and we get this confused. Anybody can be in charge. You can place yourself in charge, right? Whether or not you're a leader depends on how you behave and how people view you. Um, and so we've all had this experience probably where we have someone I know I had in the military, someone who's in a hierarchical position above me, I look at that person, I say to myself, I wouldn't follow that person anywhere. Okay. Meanwhile, there's someone over there who has no hierarchical position whatsoever standing by the water cooler, and I say, I would follow that person to hell and back. It's because of the way we behave. And so, so as so we can be in charge, or we can be a leader, um, it's best to be both. Okay. Um, but if you want to be, a, be if you want to be a leader, you have to behave like one. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Powerful. Okay, so one, and we talked a lot about habits, so this could be tricky. But if you had to pick one leadership habit that is your non negotiable for anybody who's part of your team, what would it be? Yeah, I would say I would I would go back to vulnerability. And I would say it in this in this way. Um, I used to believe this even when I was in a leadership position that there's there are three of the most important words that you can say to your people as a leader. And those three words are, I need you. Because when you say those three words to someone on your team, you are doing two things. First of all, you're you're exemplifying vulnerability, right? You're showing them what vulnerability looks like, but you're also empowering them to understand that they play a unique and powerful role in the team uh, and that you need their uniqueness. And that is a really powerful way to have them start to feel like they own and and um, and want to be there. And so so I've, I always say, I, I kind of think that those three words are really the most important words that every leader and any leader can say consistently to their people. I love that. Rich, it's been a pleasure. If people want to find out more about it, because I'd love to have you back on when the the new book is out and uh, dig a bit deeper into that. But if people want to find out about you now, well, where would they go? Absolutely. Well, the best place is the, uh, the website. So the attributes.com, you can go there. You got everything there, um, everything we do for uh, for clients, uh, keynotes, all my social media tags are there as well. So you can you can hit you can hit all uh, you can get the book from the website as well. Uh, uh, so you can hit all the all the wickets from uh, the attributes.com. So uh, love for people. And we also have, by the way, some some assessment tools on there people can can take as well. So to figure out their attributes. I'm heading over there. Sounds great. <laughs> Rich, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for coming on. You as well, Colin. Thanks so much. Wow, what a conversation. Uh, I, I love the way Rich thinks. It's, it's almost a pragmatic way that he talks through what is, from years of experience, some practices, some habits that are consistent for him. But you know, you know, when you think about the questions at the end about what are the key things, I think those struck me mostly, which is when you're a leader, you're not given the right to be a leader. You need to earn it. People need to tell you whether you're a leader or whether you're attractive or uh, intelligence. So it's, it's a, uh, I think that's one of my most powerful answers to that question. And then the one leadership habit um, that goes in there and the vulnerability and the link back to the work with uh, Brenny Brown 
uh, around the man in the arena. And I, you know, the vulnerability is a, an interesting definition, which is it's not just your downsides, your weaknesses, but it's your strengths and laying it, wearing it on your sleeve and laying it on the table for others to see. And I love that. And I think it's something as a, as a leader and as a team you can learn. I'm fascinated to see his new work into um, mastering of uncertainty and how that works, because particularly the linkage into teams and how you recruit and develop teams is, is going to be fascinating to see. So thanks to Rich. Thanks for you for listening. Another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast, and I'll look forward to welcoming you back soon.